Right. Um, so I'm mainly talking with my Genomics England hat on. I have recently moved from Sanger to King's as a full-time post. Um, so a little bit of background. So UK Health System 101. Um, firstly, this is an English project, actually, because there are four separate health systems. Um, Scotland may join the 100,000 Genomes Project, but it's, it's the English NHS which is doing this. Um, NHS England, which actually is a formal organisation now, 1.4 million employees, 110 billion per year spending, and it got reorganised substantially in April this year, last year. Um, if you want to see anything about the structure, there's a all government websites so are just one website now, um, which has been a quite a successful project, and you can actually find stuff on it if you go here. Um, <laughs> and yes, I thought that would raise some laughs. Um, so you can explore the full horrors of all the different entities we have that regulate the system and manage it, etc. Okay, so that's that. Um, now, so the fundamentals behind all this, I think, have been for a long time that we have, we've had this genomics world down here in research, and then there's the, in the health world, and in the UK at least, the health world has been going electronic for a long period of time. There has been quite a lot of money spent on electronic health record systems, not so much in hospitals, but certainly in the primary care sector. And you know, it's fairly universal, actually, a few systems across all GPs. But that's not been available for research. So you know, you'd like to get this genomic stuff into here. There's a little bit of that that has been happening at the single gene level. There are 23 centers across the UK. Um, which provide clinical genetics expertise and have been doing single gene tests, et cetera. Um, but there hasn't been this flow backwards of the electronic health. You haven't, that hasn't been accessible for research. And so there's been this long process to try and fix this, um, trying to bring together funding agencies. So there's the MRC, the Wellcome Trust, you know, the, the sort of academic funding agencies which sit in one ministry. And then there's the health service, which has its own research funder, NIHR, and there was a process in 2006 to bring them together, at least linked through this Office of Strategic Coordination of Health Research. And that's led to particularly the e-health things to try and enable the electronic health records for research. So that's the trying to deal with the research of accessibility of EHRs. And then the other side, of course, is the genomics for health. We've had the House of Lords report, which was referred to earlier, and then the Human Genome Strategy Group which was a sort of Department of Health process um, to try and work out how you might implement this in the system. Um, so that ends in 2010. Kind of in parallel with that, the government was getting concerned that the UK wasn't such a good place to do pharmaceutical research. It was actually quite triggered by Pfizer closing down its research establishment. And so they have actually you know, got together to produce this document of a life science strategy for the whole of the UK, and quite a lot of different things within this in terms of funding, support for innovation, et cetera. And some of those things were funding this bit here. So ensuring that there's actually a database for anonymized access to primary care records. And that's one component, but then you need to build capacity around using that. And so that's something else that's got funded by a mixture of these different agencies. The Fire Institute, which is four entities, just been set up, um, launched last May, um, and that will you know, build capacity across the UK um, in using those records. And then later on, we've had um, we had the Human Genome Strategy Group produce its report on how to implement genomic medicine in the UK, and in the update of the Life Science Strategy at the end of 2012, this announcement of the 100,000 Genomes Project. So this is was kind of recognition that in order to get this working, the health system wouldn't implement genetic genomic medicine because they wouldn't see it as being cost effective. So it needed some priming to get this thing started. And so that's what this commitment is, to prime it to get it started. Um, and the mechanism for doing that is the creation of this entity, Genomics England, which is a company um, wholly owned by the Department of Health, just to set up as a procurement entity to manage the system. So now you've got, you've got this side here. Of course, these are going to feed into association with this for clinical health. But essentially, you're, you're closing the loop up in terms of being able to feed back since it's seen that, you know, obviously, it's got to be about delivering this, but also understanding 
and producing the evidence in parallel. So where are we with this? So the, the mission is 100,000, um, whole genome sequencing, no, not exomes, um, to improve the health and wealth of the UK, um, build a legacy of infrastructure to be able to handle this class of data within the health system, um, and we have this 100 million over the next five years. Um, it's quite a large scale because if you, if you think Sanger has done the UK 10K project, 10,000 genomes, well, it's actually, they're not, all whole, they're not all whole genomes, some of them are exomes, but it's low coverage, whereas this is all going to be clinical, what we think of as a kind of clinical level, 30x or more. There's actually a limited amount of that around globally right now. It's mainly in the cancer projects, the National Cancer Genome Consortium and um, TGCA. And also there's a 500 project which has been done at Oxford recently of individual patients to see if you can interpret that. Um, so it's a big step up from that. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether we should be doing a million exomes or 100,000 genomes. And basically we've decided that it's the time to go to whole genome because there's all these things that you don't necessarily get if you go targeted or you go exome that you'd want to know later. And it is meant to be delivery um, but obviously it's a research data set as well. Um, so the targets are rare diseases. We already have um, the single gene tests, which are the, in these established centers. Um, but there's you know, a limited number of things that get interpreted through this in terms of diagnosis. If we start doing whole genome sequencing, then we think there's quite a lot of evidence, as we mentioned previously, that you'll end up diagnosing quite a large fraction of individuals. Um, and there's already these research consortium, of course, like, for example, DDD, the Rare Diseases Consortium in Europe, um, which have already done this. So we'll work with those groups, um, leveraging off their expertise. Um, the other side, of course, is cancer. Um, and this will be the selection of cancers. Um, there's already there's some documents on the genome mixing website about some initial suggestions of prioritization, but it's really going to be driven by this sort of evidence, incident, incidence and survival, and go after the ones which have low survival rates um, and substantial in incidence. And then pathogens, there's also a commitment to do genome sequencing pathogens, but this is going to be coordinated for another entity that got created in this reorganization called Public Health England which takes over from the Health Protection Agency in the UK. Um, so obviously it's a slightly different thing in terms of sequencing pathogens on a large scale as opposed to sequencing whole genomes. Um, so we're going to build a data infrastructure for handling this. Um, obviously sequencing centers, collection of samples, um, and incorporation of data coming out of the primary care records and the hospital systems. Um, and that will be fed back to the clinicians, but we'll also build out of that um, this integrated data set, and that will be accessible to researchers. Now, the way it will be accessible to researchers, there's a very clear statement that this data is not going to get distributed. That if you look at the, we've had open data release for the genome and things that Francis talked about. We've had managed data access, which is, of course, quite hard. Um, but this is health service data with clinical records, and it's not felt that, you know, of course, people can maybe be able to release their own data if they personally want to, but if they're a, tr a patient within the system, the data is going to be kept within the health service. And in order to do research, you'll have to bring your algorithm into the system. And with the kind of infrastructures that are now possible, virtual machines running inside a sort of local private compute cloud, we think that's possible. So the global alliance model of everything goes to the cloud, I think actually it's going to have to be modified. It's going to be federation across different countries' data because, you know, certainly right now, clouds are not the most popular um, ideas in terms of um, privacy and protection of data. So that's the model. You bring your algorithm, you run it, you can only take away the summaries, you can't take away the raw data. Um, in terms of how this is being implemented, there's a number of phases. So phase one is running right now, which is bake-offs. So the other thing to say about the whole of Genomics England, it's a thin procurement operation. It's only about 10 people. 
and we're going to buy services. So we're talking, we're, we've sent some samples to some sequencing providers. This is not a question of us building sequencing in factories. We're going to contract providers to build those and do the services. And in the initial phase, of course, samples have gone out to wherever they're doing their sequencing. In phase two, which is a pilot which will run in 2014, we'll collect about 10% of the amount of data. Um, you know, the, these will mainly be connected, they'll be collected almost under a search sort of um, consent type of arrangements. It's the main study which begins in 2015, where this will be completely integrated with the health service, and we'll expect sequences then to be in the UK, and the samples will not go out of the UK, and the data will not go out of the UK. Um, obviously, there's also an education component of this as well. Um, so, the Bake Off. So, in terms of building this, so building this whole thing, obviously you've got to go from sample to clinical action, and we're seeing this as a set of different procurements. So, obviously, this data, the, so procure some sequence, and we're expecting, at least in our initial Bake Off, we've required the sequence providers to produce BAMs and VCFs. Um, and we're going to we'll put those in the in our database, um, but we're separating that from the annotation. We're then expecting that to be the substrate for annotation, and we're going to we're going to do a competition for that. That's going to be our next phase, and we're expecting this to be entirely automated, and that to feed something useful for the clinicians inside the health service to use. Now, of course, this is a tall ask to be able to do all this. But that's what we're, we're hoping to build a market, essentially, a market for sequencing and a market for analysis, and to have different groups compete against each other to improve that. And it's not even clear, in fact, what's available right now, what level of utility the outputs of this are. Um, and it may even be that there are three steps that you know, various people have said, well, these, we can do better at refining the interpretation of the raw sequence. We're not so good at this. but we could set up something in here. So we will assess whether that adds sufficient value as well. Um, so sequencing assessments in progress. So obviously on quality, accuracy, and coverage. Um, annotation assessment's much harder because there isn't really a gold standard of what the right answer is. And there's not a data, there aren't really good data standards either. Obviously, this will have to be integrated with clinical data capture as well. Um, there are assessment exercises out there, which are you know, the Clarity Challenge and the KG Challenge. They haven't been actually quite the same, though, as being a real you know, patient, necessarily, with just the data that the doctor has. We're going to provide in this assessment exactly what comes out of the health system that will go into um, these people, these, these um, annotation providers. Um, and we'll, so we'll assess you know, how good they are at identifying pathogenic variants, how good their clinical reports are in terms of interpretation. Um, you know, and obviously, a, a key point is how fast can you turn this round, particularly for cancer? And can you operate at scale? I mean, there's a big difference between a research group that has a wonderful algorithm they published and whether you can handle you know, 100 whole genomes a day and be able to cope with that throughput and deliver in a timely fashion. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's this initial work that's going on right now, um, which will select suppliers for this pilot in 2014. Um, in the next phase, um, we'll, we'll evaluate that and use that as a basis for the main program. But when you're running in the main program as annotators, you'll be expected to adopt all these things like, again, the data isn't going to go, isn't going to go across the world to your data center. You'll have to run the annotation software inside our data center as virtual machines. And you'll be subject to the kind of things that have been alluded to in FDA terms of, you know, being of compliance requirement for the software. So it's a kind of apps type of vision for how we're going to handle the analysis. Um, we're expecting a competitive apps market to develop. Um, so that's the summary, 100,000 whole genomes um, by the end of 2017. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, there's some skepticism, but in fact now there's quite a lot of engineering around this and engagement going on in the UK.
um, and other money in the academic sectors being aligned with this in terms of infrastructure because obviously the key thing here is to collect the data, to store it and to send it through to clinical outputs but obviously a big benefit is other people using it for research, particularly the academic community. So making sure that that's possible. Um, and so I'll just acknowledge Genomics England, where I partly work one day a week, um, and all the other the various parts within the NHS and the Department of Health. And of course, a lot of this is built on all the stuff in the past around um, Sanger and Wellcome Trust and NIH. Thanks very much. Tim, I'm just wondering um, if you can give us your thoughts on how one, in quote, validates um, findings that are rare. I understand contact tracing in the infectious disease realm and host tumor sequencing. Uh, but except for some rare disorders for which I guess the evidence is quite, you know, very tight, um, what does that really mean? You I mean, mean this is the, anno the annotation assessment? So, yeah, yeah. so we don't really know. I mean, we have an advisory board for that sector. You know, the initial phase of that is really going to be who can, you know, whose software actually runs and produces an output that's intelligible, and, and to kind of assess, you know, what the range of different software providers are able to produce. Some of them will produce integration with literature. Some, you know, how useful is that to the clinician? It will still rely on clinical expertise. But in order to make any sort of real assessment, we'll have to do hundreds. And so that's the idea is to filter them down in the pilot, in the phase one, bake off, and then to assess them in a better way throughout 2014 and, and procure multiple providers during 2014. Jeff Ginsburg, I have a number of questions. I'll just keep it to one or two just to uh, let the folks behind me. So um, you, you started out saying this was a prime the pump activity that would be a demonstration that the UK should sequence 50 million genomes as opposed to 100,000. When are we going to know the answer to that question of whether this is the right strategy? 2017. <laughs> <laughs> that was an easy answer. Um, are you, End uh, of 2017. So that, so that you didn't really talk about how you're collecting the cost data around this project that's going to really enable you to make that argument. So what you mean in terms of how the, oh, so the, the economic analysis yes. type of stuff. Yes. Um, no, I didn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think, you know, that we're doing this very rapidly and it really we're trying to work out how to actually put the engineering together, particularly the connectivity of sample flow. I think right now that's the biggest priority to get sorted out. And we have set up things to feed the pilot, which is running right now. Um, that, that phase two is running right now, actually, for rare diseases. Um, but it's got to be fed to a much greater extent in phase three, 30,000 a year. That's quite a lot of connectivity into the health service. And so there's quite a lot of engineering. So we're worrying about that right now. There's only 10 of us. <laughs> yeah. Yes. OK. okay. Uh, my question is about the computing infrastructure for yeah. supporting that. Uh, how how, how how large is that the, for example, storage and uh, computing nodes? Uh, you mentioned so the virtual machine is used and some data center uh, will be used for that. And also, in addition... So none of this exists yet. Um, the, we're anticipating, you know, a BAM file, 150 gigabytes mm, per mm, sample. Mm. Um, you know, having to now... Whether we need to store that for our processing clinical pipeline, mm. maybe it's enough just to put that on tape because, in fact, VCFs, if the pipeline's good enough, maybe mm. VCFs are good enough. Mm. But the researchers certainly don't want the BAMs thrown away, not right now. Mm -hmm. So we're actually looking for you know, funds to build a data center large enough to hold all those for research purposes. And this is very like the, the million genomes proposal by Hausler in terms of how you might go about this, you know, these... Um, these file, you know, index file formats where you can just, you don't build a database, you certainly don't, it's too big. I mean, we're talking about 50 petabytes of data, perhaps. 50 if petabytes. If you store at this level. Um, mm. But there are all these compressed formats. Basically, mm. we don't know how to compress mm. genomic data mm. yet. We don't know what to throw mm. away. We don't think in this period of three years 
the community is going to work out what to throw away. So we're going to have to store it for those three years, at mm. least, and that's the kind of level, at least from the research angle. And then in terms of compute, you know, all kinds of estimates, maybe 20, 30,000 cores mm -hmm. in order to allow research activities over that. Um, but the sequencers, which we'll procure from, we're expecting them to do the analysis and provide us BAM files and mm -hmm. VCFs. The, the annotation will have to run on our system, but the demand, the load there is much lower than the initial processing. Okay, thank you. Yep, Urban Bard and Jane Brief. I'm interested in hearing about the considerations and the approach to diversity in the populations in your 100,000 sample, which I assume is considerable. Um, yes, and, but this is not a research study. This is, this, the idea here is this is driven by clinical need within the health system. So in phase three, those 30,000 will be tied into who's in the health system where we think there's most benefit to their treatment. And so this won't you know, be taken into account that much. Obviously, in terms of which centers in, in England are, have good collection of um, secondary records within the hospital system, for example, that will be a determining factor. There's no point in a sequencing if you haven't got that data. But it's not, it's not going to be um, stratified in a particular way from a research perspective. Yeah. That's fine, boring. Okay.